This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Oli Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited about today's episode as we are talking about activities to improve children's cognition through coordinative cognitive motor movement, executive function skill building strategies, and social emotional learning. Our guest holds a Doctor of Psychology degree from Pepperdine University, California. She's a Harvard trained psychologist, an international educator, author, and a pediatric psychologist in Scottsdale, Arizona. She has worked with thousands of families, teachers, and clinicians around the world to bring more cognitive skills to classrooms, homes, and clinics. She has authored several books, including Musical Thinking and 70 Play Activities for Better Thinking, Self-Regulation, Learning, and Behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Lynn Kenny. Welcome, Lynn. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing wonderfully. It's so nice to be with you today. Yeah, it's it's my my pleasure to have you. So how is everything at the moment in, in Arizona? You know, overall, we're well. Um, my practice, I work in a dyslexia intervention practice. Um, with, we're multidisciplinary, and our practice um, has been open the whole time. Um, We do wear our masks everywhere, and a lot of our schools are not open. Um, Some of the kids are going to school like hybrid. They'll go to school, like maybe they'll take one grade a few days a week, and then the rest of the kids will be online. So I'm doing a lot of therapy online, to be honest, and then seeing clients live in the office uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But I I think overall, people here in Arizona – are very active and they take their health pretty seriously. So we, we have been okay. Mm, sounds, sounds good. So you've been working on, on many themes, but should we start first, for example, from physical literacy? So, so what is it and why is it important? Well, there are a few kind of terms that I I think are really interesting for physical educators and kinesiologists and people in education. You know, physical literacy generally is, I, I define it as the awareness and understanding that motor and sensory skill competencies precede the cognitive skills that facilitate academic, social, behavioral learning. And I think it's such an interesting time. And that's why it's really fun to speak with you uh, because you're in Finland and Norway. In America, even though like 76% of the children do not get an hour of MVPA, moderately vigorous physical activity a day, even though, you know, we don't get enough movement, they are cutting arts, they're cutting music, they're cutting physical education teachers. And when we talk about the research that we'll chat about today, it's astonishing to me that we're still in a place where we want the children to sit still in order to learn, when most kids need to move to learn. Mm. Yeah. So you had a different definition for physical literacy. Could Could you open up it a little bit more? I think it was maybe difficult for everyone to comprehend right from from that description. Well, you know, <clears throat> physical literacy is awareness and understanding that we need to move in order to think. I think that that's what physical literacy is. And it's really surprising that there is a segment of the population that exercises frequently and understands that movement, any type of movement, ballet, cleaning your home, (laughs) active transport, walking to school, walking your dog. um, That is really fundamental to the health of human beings. Yet many children, um, they sit on their 
the technology all day. They play their games um, in classrooms. They they sit much, much, much too much. Um, and I think that if we can disseminate some of the applied neuroscience research in a, as you know, as you alluded to, in a simple and clear manner, we can help our communities and our schools and um, our families to get out and move more, not just for their general health, but for their long-term cognition, learning, and achievement. Mm. And and you said that you need to move to be able to think. So how how is it like that? Why is it? What is it from neuroscience point of view that why do we need to move to be able to think? Well, you know, we are agricultural beings. You know, millions of years ago, we roamed the earth picking berries and plants and our whole life was about moving from place to place in order to sustain ourselves. And then when the Industrial Revolution came, we would sit more, we would take trains, we would take planes. Um, and then when classrooms, um, you know, really industrialized, we really thought that the kids need to sit in the classrooms in order to learn when that's actually not true at all. There's actually a fascinating um, study <clears throat> by Hardeman in 2019 where they describe out of Johns Hopkins that not only is movement important for learning, but arts integrated um, learning is really important. Like, you know, doing music, doing dance, um, drawing, writing with visual note taking, all of these, I would call them foundational enrichment activities are really important in order for us to attend better stay on task, encode well into our memories, self-regulate, and <clears throat> kind of exhibit better what's called response inhibition in executive functions. And that is your self-control, your ability to really think before you act. And if we can provide opportunities to have active classrooms and kids having recess several times a day and, you know, kids walking to and from or biking to and from their schools. Everything about their learning and behavior is going to be better. Mm. So, so you said that we are agricultural animals. Mm -hmm. So is it that we have evolved in a way that somehow activity physical activity is so fundamental to us that we kind of misfunction if we don't move at all well that's absolutely true yes that's absolutely true i mean the more sedentary you are um you know sedentary not moving um the, the your social interactions are um, diminished your academic learning is diminished your cognition is diminished you have higher rates of physical illness, be it obesity, diabetes, um, cardiovascular illness. Yet we're just we are constructing a society where people people just they don't move enough. And and then it's very interesting, Ollie, because I taught I talk with Mike Kazala about this because we produced this thing called Brain Primers for Classrooms this year. And I tell him, Mike. If we just did more jump rope, <laughs> more clapping games, more mm -hmm. of the things that people did in the 1950s, and I'm not sure if they still do them in Finland, um, if, we, if we added more of that type of enrichment to our lives, Mike and I kind of wouldn't have a job because we wouldn't have to create frame primers and I wouldn't have to travel all around the world <laughs> teaching people you know, this concept of motor cognition. So it's kind of interesting. And one thing that I also say to our audiences, which is very true, is that much of the physical enrichment necessary for cognition and development, it is free. It You don't have to have a bike or go to a gym. You just need to move your body. <laughs> you need to walk and run and clean your house and play with your children and go to the park. And I just think it's so interesting that in our society, we've 
created all of these um, structures that we have to pay for when really things like jump rope and, and, you know, hula hoops and playing with balls and kicking a soccer ball around. I mean, those are pretty much very, very low cost activities. Yeah, yeah, that was that was interesting how you said that we you are kind of misfunctioning if we are not moving and it's it's affecting our thinking and and brain function. And actually a couple of hours ago I went to a outdoor gym and when I was walking back I was listening one of the podcasts you were in. And I'm not even sure what you were saying but from that it inspired an idea somehow I, i'm not an expert at this but i kind of got an idea that why activity level and posture could be linked to thinking that that probably there's like um like from evolutionary point of view when we are for example sleeping we are processing acquired information and when we are awake we are taking in new information so those are kind of in the extremes but how is it, for example, when we are relaxing? Are we in the mode of taking in new information or more in just processing what we have taken in before? So could it be that in the classroom, if you are too relaxed or too inactive, it's not maybe, mind is not maybe in the mode of receiving information, but rather just kind of processing the earlier information so <laughs> what do you think this hasn't passed peer review or even my own review as i got it just a couple of hours ago but could, could this make any sense well i think that what you're alluding to are what i call the pre-literacy skills <clears throat> so <laughs> we usually think of pre-literacy as an example if we're teaching like three four and five year olds we used to think of pre-literacy as their early counting and their numeracy and their letter recognition but we now know exactly what you've said. We have, there are all these things that precede our ability to learn. And posture, weight shift, um, balance, <laughs> and then after that, our basic motor skills all precede our learning. It's very interesting because developmental coordination disorder, which is kind of a newer diagnosis in the DSM-5, is basically when people have low coordination. Um, they have poor bilateral movement. They have poor hand eye um, yeah, hand object skills. They um, they can have poor fine motor skills. Those people, those kids, generally do not achieve academically as well as kids who are fit. And the reason that this is so is that. Brain fitness is a whole body experience. So brain fitness is this healthy state of neural circuitry in the brain where oxygenation and the motor firing of the neurons and the communication between the various hubs of the brain are working really efficiently. And we know that in children who have... Um, neurobiological diagnoses like DCD, dyslexia, uh, ADHD, depression, anxiety, to a large degree, their brain fitness is lower than kids who are achieving well. So it leads me often to think that we've got to move away from this dichotomy that the mind or brain is one thing and the body is another thing because mm -hmm. the two are constantly working together um, at a very basic motor and sensory motor level in order to provide us opportunities to, as you said, encode, you know, basically attend to the stimuli, take in the knowledge, compare mm -hmm. that knowledge to previous knowledge, and then basically we make a decision. Do we need to store that information for future use or is it not so important so we can let it go hmm. it's it's really fascinating so you said that it's pre-literacy that it's kind of precede the learning that poster weight shifting and everything would be 
would be wh- why do you think for example poster like why does it have an an effect on our brain function what's what's the point why has it evolved like that well i mean i have a colleague named shelly manel she's a pediatric physical therapist in canada and she's the one who brought to my attention posture weight shift and balance and then when i started studying the physical therapy literature it turns out that <clears throat> posture is basically what she's taught me is that having good posture enhances your oxygenation to your brain and there's actually a study by pepper that showed that when kids were slouching over trying to learn their math they did not learn as well as when they had proper posture with their core tightened and you know their shoulders up back and down i actually teach this in our clinic in our um in our workshops that what good posture actually feels like and a lot of us over time especially me you know i'm sitting at a desk a lot i ha- i do have a exercise um bike underneath my desk so i pedal pretty much all day long as well but we <clears throat> we have a problem with our musculature in the front of our shoulders because we're hunched over typing all the time or for people who are gaming you know they're using their thumbs just gaming all the time so the preliteracy skills are broader than posture weight shift and balance but i think mm-hmm. that those sensory motor pieces are so central to what makes us human that we need to fix those things first and then we can move on to the other things which we would call the executive functions um you know so i call them i call the most prominent executive functions sam self regulation and self control attention and memory there are many more but if you don't have your sam working well then as dr bruce wexler says at yale no matter what you introduce to a child who who doesn't have their sam working it's going to be like pouring water on a bottle that has the lid closed hmm. and so opening the preliteracy skills <clears throat> getting kids to move getting them to have good posture getting them to be able to clap on a beat getting them to be able to stomp on a beat getting them to be able to um balance on you know like their their uh not scooters but their skateboards those activities provide the platform on which the executive functions self regulation and opportunities for learning to healthfully evolve mm. fascinating i i really find this really interesting so You said that the poster is about oxygenation to the brain and slouching makes it different and I I really believe that there's a thousand year culture of meditation in certain posture and it's pretty much how you how you described so I don't think it's just by chance that they sit in a certain mm-hmm. posture This podcast is sponsored by Fibian a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting standing physical activity and energy expenditure furthermore fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light moderate and vigorous intensity in addition to scientific accuracy fibian provides automatically produced and easy to understand reports for research participants get scientific validation and learn more about fibian at fibian.com/research fibian from researchers to researchers and then then you mentioned that even like clapping on the on the beat and sense of rhythm is important could we go more into that that like i understand that for example if it's about oxygenation of the brain but how does clapping or stomping feet on rhythm makes us learn better Hmm. Well, this is one it's a newer area of research. So, when I'm teaching in our courses, um, you know, what is evidence-based versus what is clinically observed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there's kind of Ollie, there's like um I call it a a V pattern. So, if you take a triangle and turn it upside down, it's like wide at the top and narrow at the bottom. And at the top, 
nobody's arguing that physical activity is good for people. Like scientists don't argue about that. We have studies for over 50 years and we don't even need studies. <laughs> you know, walking, moving, being in nature, uh, interacting with people, having social relationships that involve activity, it's all really good for you. And there's actually some research that shows that people who are physically fit do better academically. Hmm. Then the next layer, I'm just telling you this because I'm going to get to this newest layer, um, hmm. coordinative rhythmic beat based movement, which is, so then the next layer is, does physical activity, how does, how is physical activity related to those pre-literacy skills, including the executive functions? Because we now know that we used to think IQ was a really big predictor of achievement, but we now know that the executive functions are a better predictor of achievement than IQ. Okay, so <clears throat> having your brain, having good brain fitness and having the hubs in for your brain really working and having good attention, good self regulation, um, good response inhibition, good motor control, these are all highly correlated with academic achievement. Now, the next layer, which I think is further down and requires a lot more study, when I was really, really like developing Spotlight and some of our cognitive motor activities in 2013, when I would talk to the scientists with whom I was working, I would say, you guys, I have hypotheses based on my clinical observations of the children with whom I work, but we need many years of controlled studies to know which types of movement under which types of conditions will help which types of kids. So then I, now I can answer your question because <laughs> it's always very important, right? It's very important to know that um, there's a lot more research to be done. What we know from um, auditory neuroscience and some work in language is that Beat saliency, I call it beat competency because to me it's a skill, but in the literature, if you go to NCBI and you look it up, you're going to find the term beat saliency. The ability to perceive and respond in time to a beat motorically, auditorially, and visually is associated with better brain fitness. So most of these, most of these studies are mostly done with finger tapping because they need to really have control. When you're doing, you know, random controlled designs, you have to have interventions that you can control well. So many of them are this finger tapping. Although consistent with one of your podcasts, they are now using motion capture cameras. And I've been in some of those labs that have like literally 19 motion capture cameras around the perimeter of the ceiling. That's going to that's gonna speed along this research really nicely because developmentalists know that motor and cognition go together, but that hasn't really gotten to physical education and education that much yet, but it's coming because in 2013, I might've been able to collect 30 studies on this. Yesterday, I reorganized my research. Um, I have a little research library, and I had over 300 studies, not only on motor timing, but it's just fascinating because I could talk about this forever, so <laughs> I'll just try to be more succinct. Um, we are rhythmic humans. Bef when we were animals, we used rhythmicity to, and sound to communicate with one another. So musicality is very deep in our genetic design. Then we were able to develop language, which came from emitting sounds. And so tempo, timing, and rhythm, even if you just think of it, Ollie, in the, the exercise of I speak, you speak, I speak, you speak, mm -hmm. just that I call that um, like, it's like, it's kind of like a, tennis ball exchange. I hit the ball, then you hit the ball. I hit the ball, you hit the ball. We mm. know from studies of toddlers that when at two years of age, children are able to do that verbal volley in time correctly, 
Mm. Um, they, they have better um, reading, spelling, and math in, you know, as evaluated between like five to seven years of age. Mm. So there's so many parts of it because there is what we talked about before, those pre-literacy skills, you know, just having um, a good sensory platform and a good motor platform. And then you build on that, you build your self-regulation and your executive functions. And then as a part of that, um, coordination, rhythmicity, and timing are all very important to our human exchanges, but they're also important to our learning. Mm. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. So I, I try to wrap up. So you said that we are rhythmical animals, that it's in our genetic design and that we we communicated before with with sounds. Do you do you see it like a birds singing and and or what what animals do you think with the sounds in in this case I, I don't know how the monkeys actually even communicate is it is it rhythmic sounds or how how does it work you know there is a, like a, an animal um it's not anthropological but there's a field of study about this i'm not that knowledgeable about it um, what I've paid more attention to is like, there's a really good article that you would really enjoy by Jerry Leesman. And mm. it's about thinking, talking and walking and the relationship between motor cognition. And it was written a few years ago, but it's still a really good article. I can get it to you. Yeah. Um, and then there's a really good book too, by Mewson on kind of motor cognition and some of the evolutionary components are referenced in those works so i can i can send you those citations mm. if we just kind of come into the present and think about the kids in our homes and the kids with whom we play um musicality is a big part of infancy tapping things um using spoons on you know on little drums or even equipment in your kitchen, um, playing sing song, learning the give and take in communication, the give and take in walking and movement, the give and take in play, the give and take in, you know, just I put a cube in, in a little box and then you put a cube in a little box. Mm. All of that rhythmicity um, enhances our social engagement. When we are in sync with other humans, we feel safer, we feel loved. Um, we probably are calmer and able to take in information and learn better. So that that musicality um, and rhythmicity is just a really important part of our early developmental lives and experiences. Mm. Yeah, and I, I can see easily the rhythmicity, like you said, between dialogue between two people or putting putting a toy one by one and, and so on. But how, how does it relate to like more complicated, like for example, music? Like why why do we have, have music? Why why does it thrills us? Why why can it uh, evoke emotions in us I, I find it really interesting that it it is such a strong thing for us music yes you know for your podcast i heard on one of your podcasts you said you know if you have people that you know i might like to interview let me know who they are i think that mm. for the, i'll talk about this musical part but two people who would be fascinating for you are one is nacho aramani and he's mm. basically a musician for the brain and the other is bastian sanic he's in paris Mm -hmm. um, and he created, he with a colleague created Meludia, which is a, it's a music theory education game where you are learning all the things that we're talking about, but you, you, they don't even talk about music really. You don't read a note. You just, you just practice the components of your auditory and visual musical systems. So you would, you would like to talk with them because they'll know a lot more about the music piece. 
Hmm. What strikes me in terms of um, <clears throat> how it relates to physical education and even developmental psychology and dyslexia interventions, ADHD interventions, there's a big body of research specifically in Parkinson's disease. There's much more research about beat and rhythm-based rehabilitation in adults than there is in children. There are some with children, but a lot of it is with the adults. And basically what they identify, and this fascinates me, is that beat and rhythm-based rehabilitation um, are some of the most effective treatments for Parkinson's and for gait challenges. Um, so musically cued gait training is a current and interesting line of inquiry. And it's interesting because people are different. Some people respond better to auditory cues and some people respond better to visual cues. But we do as human beings tend to be faster at perceiving the auditory cues. Like if you're doing interactive metronome or something like that, they've got mm -hmm. a few studies that show that when you're tapping to the beat, you will respond more quickly to the auditory because it's a faster processing than is the mm -hmm. visual. Um, so this beat perception and rhythmicity develops spontaneously in human beings, but there's a lot of variability in our beat perception skills. Some people are quite rhythmic. Some people aren't very rhythmic. And we, in our work, um, with mostly little children who have dyslexia, we combine the language interventions with occupational therapy and rhythm-based movement interventions all at the same time in order to enhance that brain fitness. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that is really interesting what you brought up with the Parkinson's and it mm -hmm. got me thinking like, if you actually look at, look at the muscle activation, electromyography, for example, from human walking, it's it's a really complicated task, mm -hmm. rhythmic task of probably 20 muscles firing for certain times, switching off quickly and the other muscles are going. So, so do you think like this kind of rhythmicity of activating muscles, even, even though we don't do it consciously, it is somehow automatic either in our brain or in our spinal cord. Do you think this links to the, all these things that we have talked earlier? Well, I know from some of the research in balance and dance in adults that, you know, adults, this is a little tangential, but it's related. Hmm. Falling, falling, losing your balance and falling is one of the most common injuries for older people who were previously healthy. And what I learned from some professors with whom I interact is that your loss of balance is actually begins in the brain and is one of the first signs of the potential budding of dementia. So our brains, it, even though everything rests on the subcortical structures in our brains, um, you know, the, your executive functions rest on your sub, subcortical structures, be it your limbic system and then your cerebellum. Again, the brain fitness, the ability to, of the brain to work well and communicate efficiently between the hubs, that's what communicates and drives to the body to move in specific ways. So when you have loss of gray matter or um, diminished communication between the hubs along the white matter, theoretically that comes before the motor challenge. And we could talk, I mean, there are probably people who know this piece much better than I do, but I was really fascinated to learn that it's not that your body goes when you're older, it's that the guide of your body, your brain working with your body is what begins to go. Mm. And and you have mentioned many times the word brain fitness. It's it's a very, very interesting term. Could you could you tell a little bit more about what all is included in the brain fitness and and how does it does it work? 
Well, there's a good report by um, Brain Futures in 2019. I can get you that as well. In fact, all, most of these links are on my blogs, but I'm happy to send you some things. Um, you know, we've got, we've talked about pre-literacy. We talked about physical literacy. Brain fitness is the ability of the brain and the body to work together in a, with, with highly effective communication between the circuitry, really. And we really know that movement, physical activity, specifically including moderately vigorous physical activity where you're actually increasing your endorphins, you're increasing your oxygenation, you're getting your neurotransmitters to, to really communicate, you're increasing your BDNF. Um, those are all very important in order to develop better brain fitness. But there are other parts to it because you want to be practicing decision-making, planning, um, thinking things through, response inhibition, self-regulation, you know, modulating the internal energy within your body. That all comes together, I think, in what I would call brain fitness. So brain fitness to a lot of people is about just cognition. To me, brain fitness is about the, the relationship between the brain and body hmm. facilitating the health of both. Hmm. And, and you said that especially the moderate, vigorous physical activity is, is important. It releases endorphins, neurotransmitters, and so on. How do you see the continuum from sedentary behavior to light activity, moderate, vigorous, and then maybe even short-term sprinting or something? How, how do you see these different intensities in relation to brain function? Well, I think that people in kinesiology would probably have some pretty informed opinions about this. In my reading and, you know, reviewing of the literature over the past like 10 years, we used to as a society think you've got to go to the gym as an example for 45 to 60 minutes, you know, but now we realize that all forms of movement are beneficial. You want to have good flexibility you want to, we've already said you want to have good balance. You want mm. to have good predictive power in your movement. Like if you want to reach for a cup of water, you want to actually reach properly for that cup of water. So the, the powers to be like the CDC and, and um, researchers really want every human being to be getting 60 minutes of vigorous activity, but all those other movements that you're doing through the day matter as well. You know, just getting up from your desk every 20 minutes and walking into, you know, say hello to a colleague or stopping and getting on the floor with your children in order to play. Um, all of those kinds of movements are important. I, I don't think it's sit all day and then go to the gym for an hour. I think it's move all day. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, even if it's very light movement. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you brought into discussion like flexibility, balance, and and other skill based things. Like, how how do you see the importance of these in relation to, for example, moderate vigorous intensity activity? And are these reflected in the current recommendations of of physical activity to children? So can you, can you say, what's the question again? How, what's the relationship between which things? Yeah, I think I made two questions. Sorry for that. So, so how, how do you see you brought up the flexibility, balance, and different kind of skills in relation to kind of just aerobic, moderate to vigorous intensity activity? How important you see that this kind of skill-based things are for, for brain function? Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're very important for brain function. And I'll tell you, curiously, there is a ballet instructor in New York named um, Tika Tellier. And when COVID came, she started doing her classes online. 
and I purchased the year of classes. And I had one of my colleagues from our clinic take a Saturday morning class with me. And we were both astonished at how vigorously we were sweating and breathing, even though we were doing very simple ballet movements, you know, tapping our toes in rhythm, lifting our knees in rhythm. We were not Mm -hmm. doing a jeté or jumping in the air. I was like holding onto a ballet bar. And it just amazed me that Antika Tellier talks all the time about the importance of posture. She thinks that posture is the core of everything. She says that in order to increase your speed athletically or your speed in ballet dancing, you have to be focused on having good posture and a tight core. Um, And I just think that's fascinating. So Hmm. these fun, and it just makes sense from a sensory motor standpoint, those foundational motor skills precede everything else. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you're using. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.